Thank you. So I think the plan is I'm going to talk for 45 minutes. That's the plan. And then we have a nice long uh, you know, session for Q&A. Um, and I might just spend a couple of minutes telling you a little bit what I'm doing, uh, a little bit more detail. And then I'll um, uh, try and keep you awake, because <laughs> it's after lunch. Um, so uh, first of all, I wrote the book partly because uh, meeting investors in many places, uh, I often came across people who would say to me, you know, well, where's that written down? And I, <laughs> I didn't know where it was written down. And I even had one person then apologize for not having read the book, which I explained was quite understandable in the circumstances, because I hadn't written it. Um, and uh, so eventually, I sort of pulled my finger out. It, it took nine drafts, many years. Uh, I remember I met uh, Mohammed uh, Alerian, who you all know very well, who I've known for many years. And I met him, uh, and he, he said uh, uh, he was very pleased, because he said he'd written his book in nine days. And I was thinking, goodness me, <laughs> I'm never going to do that. <laughs> but he did encourage me to write it as well. He said I really should write it. He was one of the people who said I should write it. Um, so, and what I'm doing now is really, you know, New Spot is just my money, it's just a private office. My, my wife uh, didn't marry me for lunch, so uh, I felt I had to go and do something. Plus, there's a sense of responsibility, frankly. If you've got a bit of money, um, and I was fortunate enough to, to be in that position, then I think it's important to use it, you know, not just sort of sit on it. And, and you know, I can't stand playing golf, you know, it's just, uh, life is too short, frankly. So. Um, I, I basically set up uh, New Sparta, and what I have, I've got quite a lot of companies, but that's because I, I'm not a micromanager. I, I believe in leadership and finding really good people uh, who are managing directors then of a company or a division of companies, and they get very clear budgets, very clear business plans, and they actually are the experts, and I basically run the board. So I actually only do about three days a week in London, and the rest of the time I'm I'm chair of a university. I do a lot of music. I play a lot of double bass and things. So, um, what? Uh, and the five divisions are insurance. Actually, I've got a couple of broker. Uh, I've got a Lloyd's broker, um, uh, very small. Uh, I've got uh, some publishing. I've got some journalism. So we have a company called BNE Business New Europe and Intellinews, which is a list business which we've merged to become the the premier uh, business uh, journalism in Eastern Europe. And I want to expand that. It's already in in uh, Middle East, I want to expand it across Africa, etc. Um, and then I've actually, I do have some film businesses, <laughs> bizarrely. Um, I had a friend who left Ashmore earlier and got involved in film, and I thought, why on earth would anybody invest in film? I mean, you know, it's a recipe for losing money, and I don't even watch many films, actually. Um, but they said, oh, no, it's good, because you, you'll be objective about it. Most people aren't. And I worked out 80% of films that are made should never be made. Um, and it's, you know, I'm doing quite well. I bought the second largest uh, distributor in the UK, and I've got my own production company and seems to be doing well and it's largely saying no to things um, which seems to be the trick anyway um, the biggest thing though is, is telco and I, I, I was lucky enough well first of all I have a brother who's, who's a, been doing telco on the, on, the, on the engineering side as a cyberneticist for 30 years and I wouldn't be doing it without him but I met a chap in Delhi um, a British guy uh, back in 07 and I ended up buying his company which is now the sixth largest phone company in the UK We've bought another company, it's called Nucor Telecom, another company called Wavecrest, which is a global minute aggregator. And then through that, we've invested in India. And the stuff in India is 10 times larger. Um, but the interesting thing is we've invested in India as a telco company. And that's been a very different experience to investing financially. And we've, we've bought the fifth largest social messaging company in the world, Nimbus, which has over 200 million customers, and the largest Wi-Fi hotspot company, which I'm building up. And the key, of course, to all investing is buy really good assets from distressed sellers for virtually nothing, which are then suddenly worth billions. That's the key, by the way. Uh, nice little tip for you. Now, um, <laughs> what I've, I've also very conscious, as I said, I need to keep you awake. So I've been told by one of my colleagues I should always uh, uh, tell this story at the beginning. Um, and it does involve Germany. Um, we have debt to GDP problems in, in the West. Uh, and I'll say in a minute how I think that happened. And uh, so call it a dead body. I wrote this actually initially in, in a paper in 2011 uh, about uh, the five stages of grief. The first stage of grief is denial. We don't have to discuss the other four because we're still in denial, by the way. Um, and so this is all about denial. So in the UK, we have, if you count all the liabilities, the debt to GDP is actually about 500%. Um, in the United States, it's you know, even bigger, but it's 500% in the UK. Uh, you call that a dead body. We've got this dead body. 
it's causing a bit of a mess and we're having a big debate about you know, how to clear it up. And um, you know, Osborne and all the others are arguing about it. And well, the clear consensus obviously is to have a housing bubble because that's a really useful policy tool uh, because it doesn't have the same impact as other stimulus on, on, on the balance of payments. It's a very important uh, thing to have, but we'll deal with that later. In, in the Eurozone, of course, you already have a, you also have a dead body. Uh, of course, the German kitchen floor is spotless. <laughs> Absolutely spotless, no problem here. And the dead body is around the periphery and it's causing a terrible mess. And of course, you guys have got all the cleaning equipment as well. So you could clear it up. But I think quite reasonably, you're saying, well, why should we clear it up when you're just going to create another one? You know, we've got to have some rules. And then we've got other people, maybe a bit further uh, you know, to the west of Germany, saying, no, that's not the idea. We have to, A, ignore the problem. We have to print lots of money. And we don't want rules. So we're having this big argument. And this argument hasn't really resolved itself yet. But we have got a solution at least temporarily, which is we take a nice big sheet and we cover the body. <laughs> Unfortunately, we now need a bigger sheet and then a bigger one. And meanwhile, the blood is sort of seeping out and it's getting in the shoe leather, which is getting a bit sticky. Don't know how you feel. I don't know whether you know about that sort of thing. But, um, so that's what's going on in Europe. In the United States, they've taken the body, they've put it in a chair, they've given it a cup of coffee, and they're having a conversation with it. Because in the United States, they are the United States. By definition, there is no problem. <laughs> and the dollar is king and all the rest of it. So we live in a world of denial. One of the most interesting things that I think I, that sort of fascinates me is how people have different world models. They have different perceptions of reality. And the really interesting thing is when these perceptions suddenly change. So I'm reminded here of Thomas Kuhn, who wrote... Uh, this famous book, the, uh, the Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And it's from that book we get the term paradigm shift, which of course has been uh, uh, overused since. But he's talking about when, um, first of all he's saying that scientists uh, do not work things out from first principles. I mean if they did, you know, they'd never get very far because they'd be redoing the same work. So you have to, what you have is, is a consensus of models, of, 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 of theory. Uh, and, and as Newton says, you know, you stand on the shoulders of giants. So what happens is you get a, if you like, a paradigm. And the interesting thing is when you shift from something like Newton to Einstein. So Einstein comes along and he's got a new theory. And it explains everything that Newton explains. Plus, it explains the trajectory, uh, the orbit of Mercury, which Newton doesn't because the gravitational pull actually is so big it distorts space-time to a measurable extent. So what's interesting is that even then, it takes a while for the, the scientists to change their prejudice. And then, of course, there's this sort of S-shape move, but then you have to wait for all the, the scientists to die before you actually get 100% consensus. And, and Einstein himself, famously, was very sceptical about quantum theory until the day he died. Now, that's science. That's kind of evidence-based stuff, or we hope it is, a lot of stuff that they call science isn't evidence-based, but let's assume it is. Um, and what we do in investment, uh, of course, is, <laughs> is a long way from that. And we have our fashions. And often our fashions are wrong. And I want to take you in the, the core of what I'm going to say is, a, is an attack on finance theory. And I'm going to take you back to the 1950s and say why we, where we made some mistakes. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about uh, macroeconomics. But I'm also going to give you a first, a little anecdote. My son, my second son, uh, I'm very lucky, works for me now, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, he's got two degrees in economics, and whilst he was doing one of them, he uh, contacted me and he said, Dad, I've got this paper, and it says something I don't quite, doesn't fit. It says that people didn't foresee the crisis in Thailand in 97 until the last minute. I'm thinking, no, that's wrong, <laughs> you know. I remember it very well, we were telling investors to get out six months before, and that's not because we can do anything more than read because the IMF was very explicit. <laughs> and if that's not obvious enough, you don't even have to read the IMF. You just you know, read the newspaper, because George Soros had had a massive speculative attack six months earlier, which has only prevented uh, you know, from, from, from collapsing the bar because the Malaysians and other central banks bailed the country out. So what is an academic, years later, doing, writing, nobody foresaw the crisis? And then you read on, because the spreads didn't widen until the last minute. What that tells you is that some people didn't see it. That's what it says. That's a different thing. We have, we, I think, for, 
far too often we assume that the market is some sort of homogenous entity which is perfectly efficient. It isn't. It's made up of individual uh, and very often separate and different pools of liquidity and, de and supply and demand. So what was interesting here is how uh, you've got, on the one hand, people who are uh, familiar with IMF logic, who have seen balance of payments crisis, maybe in an emerging market like Latin America, and they come to Thailand and think, oh, obviously balance of payments crisis is coming. I'm not doing that market or I exit. And people, of course, have maybe some existing investors have their eureka moments. They work out there's a problem. And by the way, once you shift from believing in Newton to Einstein, you don't go back, right? This is a one-way uh, development. So once you get your moment, you realize, oh, this is a crisis. You don't go back. And what happens is all these people exit and over time, gradually, and the people who remain, who see an arbitrage, they just gradually buy more and more because they see a few basis points, oh, we'll buy that, we'll buy that. And over time, you end up with a very homogenous investor base, such that when they all want to sell, you've got a serious problem because there's nobody on the other side of the trade, because there's nobody else in the market uh, or potentially in the market who does have a different view to you. And they're all getting the same uh, eureka moment at the same time because they are very similar. So that's what happened in Thailand. I remember, um, it was, it was, I was at Ashmore at the time, but it was my uh, colleague now, my replacement, Jan, who, who told me about this because he went to the meeting where there were a bunch of breakfast meetings, a bunch of people talking about Greece. And they went around the table saying, well, what, you know, what, what the question was, where do you think the Greek bond should be? I don't know what year, this must have been 09 or something. And uh, the argument went around, well, it's got to be, <clears throat> you know, if you, look about the, if you look at the spread over bonds, it can't get more than, you know, two standard deviations, you know, from the normal, you know, maybe three. So you can't, can't, the price cannot get below 85 cents on the dollar. And then, of course, it came to Yan, I think there's another emerging markets person there, because, you know, poor cousins we invited to the big table. Um, he said, well, I think of the problem in a very different way. When you have a country which doesn't have, which has a big debt, uh, first of all, what is the sustainable debt to GDP for that country at the minute? And that's going to be very different for different countries and very different for the same country at different times. It's a bit like what's the appropriate re reserve ratio for a banking system that the central bank insists. And the answer is it's whatever is sufficient to you know, give confidence to the market. And for you know, Japan, where maybe the domestic savings uh, uh, are, are actually the main supplier of money and there's lots of moral suasion, it might be 300%. You know, for Italy, it might be 120%. But for Greece, it was probably 60 So, so which after all is Maastricht. So say it's 60 But say it was 120 Actually, the IMF did say it was 120 Why? Oh, because Italian debt was 120 and, of course, if you'd said it was 60 for Greece, people might think that that's applicable to Italy, and then you get a problem. So they kind of fudged that one. <laughs> um, but even if it was 120, it still would have not... The, the next question gives the same answer, which is, can you, through fiscal austerity or regular policies, get from where you are today to there? Um, and the answer is no. If the answer is no, there are two and only two policy possibilities. One... A devaluation, making sure that the debt you owe is in the devalued currency, of course. And secondly, some form of restructuring or default on your debt. That's it. End of story. And if at that time of history, you know, uh, well, euro exits out of the question in 2009, um, then, you know, barring, I mean, there is another option, but it's not your option, the policymaker, which is getting bailed out. It's, it's not living in the real economic world, which is actually sort of what's, what's happened. But, but the, the only other option is, you know, <laughs> Uh, uh, writing off the debt. And then it's a simple back-of-the-envelope calculation. Oh, well, we have to write off 80, 85%, not the 15%. It's a very different number. And then, of course, all the around the breakfast table, all, all the jaws are dropping. Because once, once this logic's been explained, you can't kind of go back to thinking it's, there's no default risk. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a revelation. So that's another example where the perception of reality can really change. But it's also highlighted what I think is, is something I... I've been told is one of the two really original things about the book, uh, which is the structure of the investor base being important. The other one is how to do strategic thinking. Um, and then I, I'll, I'll come back to that. If I don't, ask me a question, I'll come back to it. But I want to I go back a little bit to the theory. Uh, first of all, to economics. I, um, I'm going to give you, first of all, a definition. Um, this is Frank Knight's definition in 1921, that risk, 
um, uh, is defined as where you have random events and you know the probability distribution, so you can, you can hedge or insure it, as opposed to uncertainty where you don't know the probability distribution and therefore you can't. And actually Frank Knight called them one-off events. Keynes' general theory in a single sentence, apologies to Keynes, is that when you have a lot of uncertainty in an economy, then entrepreneurs will not build new factories and employ more people, and they will delay those decisions. And as a result, that creates more uncertainty for others in the economy, which has a positive feedback effect, which causes a slump. That's Keynes. And right from the start, when John Hicks created the ISLM framework, and that's about as technical as I'm going to get in this discussion, um, he was criticised for excluding that uncertainty concept. And then we had decades of um, uh, uh, trying to square the circle between two very different subjects, microeconomics and macroeconomics. Um, the, the whole, not just the Chicago school, but the New Keynesian school, uh, really tried to create what's called the microeconomic foundations of macroeconomics. And as someone like Skidelsky is pointing out, you know, he thinks that macro is a completely, should be taught in different courses. You know, I certainly, having taught economics myself, I've, I've been amazed sometimes that undergraduates go through a, a course learning two completely contradictory subjects without realising it. Um, and it doesn't really matter, though, unless you've got depression-type uh, risk, which we do now. Bernanke is a student of the Depression, student of Keynes, so he got it. When you have uh, a big banking crisis, a big banking problem, uh, we know, I mean, there have been hundreds of years, the first really big uh, uh, you know, systemic financial crisis, of course, was in 1720 in France, caused by a Scotsman, of course. Um, and uh, we've had hundreds, actually thousands of banking crises since. And uh, what we have uh, is, you know, even the book on how to regulate banks, written by Badshot in the 1870s. You know, it's very clear. When you have a big banking problem, you seize the bank, you the policymaker. You seize the bank, you fire the management. You work out very quickly which lending is essential for the economy, and you continue that lending, and you deal with the other problems <laughs> in, different, in a variety of different ways. We didn't do that. We didn't do that in the States. We didn't do it really in Europe very much. Um, and we didn't do it for political, but also ideological reasons, and lobbying, and all the rest of it. So Bernanke's, and a banking system, by the way, is a bit like a, can I borrow your glass of water? It's a bit like a glass of water. It's got liquidity in it, and uh, if you want liquidity to go, in, I'm not going to do this, but if you want the liquidity to go into the real economy, it has to come over the brim. And you can have it this full or this full, it makes no difference, it's still not working. So if you've got a two trillion dollar hole in your uh, 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 banking system and you put a trillion dollars in, it's not good enough. Um, so. Bernanke saw depression risk coming. So that's why QE was invented. QE was not designed to stimulate the economy. It was designed to bail out the banks to save the economy from depression, which is, bar war, the worst possible, possible scenario. And a lot of the liquidity, of course, went straight round in a circle back to the central bank in the form of excess reserves. And um, so it didn't get into the real economy, but it did push up asset prices. It did help banks recapitalize themselves and even in the design of QE1 and QE2, we had a steepening in the yield curve, which the market didn't expect because bad for the housing market. But that wasn't, at that point of time, the priority. The priority was avoiding depression. Now, if I'm a central bank governor and I'm actually doing everything I can to avoid depression, actually what I don't want to do is tell the market that's what I'm doing. That would be suboptimal because then that might create the, the uncertainty that maybe it'll not work. If you look panicked, and that's your priority, and it's not going to work, that'll create the uncertainty that causes the depression. So the optimal policy uh, is to tell everybody that the emperor has wonderful new clothes. So that's QE. The stress test, by the way, you know, I think was the key event that actually made the, the, the restructuring of the banks in, in, in the US uh, uh, credible. And, and, uh, and you know, they have recapitalized the banks now, much more successfully than, than in Europe, by the way. The, um, so we have two problems. One, Two big macroeconomic problems. One is, is the indebtedness in, the, in what I call the heavily indebted developed countries. And secondly is global imbalances. Um, the global imbalances also help cause the indebtedness. And what is global imbalances? Um, uh, in 1944, we had the Bretton Woods Conference uh, where we agreed to have uh, currencies pegged to the dollar and the dollar convertible to gold at the old US Treasury rate of $35 an ounce. That, however, uh, caused what's called the Triffin Dilemma, a problem whereby if you have a central bank, which is both central bank to the world and to one country, in this case the United States, 
you have uh, a natural uh, problem. Uh, and to explain it in sort of layman's terms, if, if, if the global economy, think about them two, two economies, right? Global and US. So global X US. If the global economy wants, is growing faster than US, you have to provide money, otherwise you get stagnation. But the money is printed over here in the US economy. So how do you get the money from there to the global economy? If you're not careful, you do it by building up liabilities in the US. And that's kind of what happened in the 60s. You had a situation where the gold, which was meant to be back, backing the dollar, 100%, was not sufficient to back the dollars. So the London gold market then started to speculate against the dollar. And then European central banks got together, seven of them, and had a deal, deals with the US. There was a system called the gold pool where they intervened to stop to, to counter that by buying dollars. And this all worked perfectly until the Italians started cheating and selling, selling uh, dollars. <laughs> and then uh, the real, and others actually. And, and then, of course, the final straw was when uh, uh, the brash US Treasury Secretary uh, uh, came over to uh, uh, Europe and said in a very famous conference, he said, uh, the dollar is our currency, but it's your problem. And, and then uh, the, uh, uh, the Bank of England asked for their gold back. And Nixon came off gold. And there are versions of history that said, oh, that was Nixon's choice. Rubbish. <laughs> no, he did. Well, technically he had a choice. He could have run out of gold first and then done it. Uh, but he really didn't have a choice. In other words, the bargaining power exists with the creditor nations. The creditor nations have a big collective action problem. The creditor nations don't act, don't, don't, don't act, don't act. Nothing happens, and then suddenly it all happens. Dollar went from 35 to $194 an ounce in 1974. Big, big devaluation. Uh, chaos. Other currencies went down as well, so you don't see that deval in terms of other currencies, and you had a decade of inflation wiping out the imbalances. But we didn't we didn't end up with a working monetary system. We still have no international monetary system which is functional. And just as Greenspan had his laissez-faire moment and decided that we didn't need to regulate banks, which is one of the two reasons why we had a banking problem in, in, starting in the US, uh, the emerging markets had their laissez-faire dalliance uh, 10 years before. They said, well, look, we're the capital-scarce part of the world relative to other factors of production. We should be importing lots of capital. And to do that, we need to have uh, open capital accounts. And the basic error, which has often been the case, is that people confuse asset markets with good markets. In a goods market, when the price goes up, the demand goes down, except one particular type of good, uh, the Giffin good, of which there's only one clear example, which was the, the potato in the Irish potato famine. Um, but apart from that, basically, when the price goes up, demand goes down. In an asset price, it's often the, exactly the opposite. Price goes up, people want, to, want more of it. Uh, and it just goes up and up. And that's why you get massive overshooting. And this is particularly true in lots of assets, but including FX, of course. And so by opening your capital account, you are making yourself vulnerable uh, to, to overshooting. And for that, you need insurance. And the insurance that was provided by the IMF was seen in the Asian crisis as insufficient. So the policy response was to self-insure by the building up of your own reserves. So this, a historian's going to look at this in a few decades and think, this is really odd. So I've got the capital-scarce countries here. Oh, by the way, they have 30% 30 30 savings rates, and it's 85% of the world's population, and they're now using purchasing power parity. They're 56% of global GDP. So the bulk of humanity, bulk of economic activity, bulk of growth, 30% savings rate, they are generating huge amounts of, 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 of liquidity. And what do they do with it? Do they invest it in the infrastructure in their own countries? No, they export it to the United States and push the whole yield curve down in the US, creating an artificial sense of risk there, which together with Greenspan created the bubble. So they're exporting it in order to provide insurance for themselves, which they then haven't used. <laughs> so they're sitting on now 85% of central bank reserves are in emerging markets, and it's not just China. That's the global imbalance. As Herb Stein, advisor to President Nixon in 1971, famously said, and I love this statement, it's a very Forrest Gump uh, statement, he said, when something's unsustainable, it will stop. And that's true, it will stop. But the question is, how will it stop? Will it gradually go the other way eventually, or will it be a massive crisis, like in 1971? These are the two big, big structural problems in the global economy today. Global imbalances, high levels of indebtedness in the developed world. This matters today. It matters so much. I'm saying you need to have these macro factors right at the top in your thinking about any asset allocation whatsoever. So now we're going to take a, another sort of 
line of thought, and I'm going to go back to finance theory. If there are problems in economics, which there certainly are, it's much worse in finance theory. As you all know, by the way, <laughs> anybody who studied finance theory and then actually tried to put it into practice knows there are some, some basic problems with it. Um, and if you go back to 1959, Markowitz wrote a, a book, a, a, what do you call it, a memorandum, 360 pages, I call that a book. Uh, and he says in one point, you know, he's trying to explain the variance of, an, of a particular asset. And he's explaining it in terms, you can say, you can explain the variance, uh, he calls it risk, he's talking about volatility. Uh, he, he, in terms of the idiosyncratic risk, as he calls it, which is only specific to that stock, and covariances with other stocks, and correlations to an index. And there's one sentence here, it says, but for computational ease, we shall ignore the covariances to other stocks. That's it. That germ, not theoretically based at all, no justification whatsoever, is why today, decades on, we have this lunacy, in my view, of using indices to represent asset classes as building blocks in asset allocation. So you, you agree with all this, I'm sure. <laughs> um, we have, you know, what, what is an asset class? I mean, in the beginning, there were two asset classes, uh, US Treasuries and the S&P 500. The world outside the United States does not exist. Remember the, the guy with the coffee? Yeah. And um, we then have made huge progress. And we have, uh, you know, David Svensson's Yale model, which is taught in business schools around the world. Um, and, you know, he, he is, uh, he's a bit, for me, he's a bit like the, 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 the you know, the Stone Age man that works out how to, how to, how to create fire. Massive technological advance. You know, you can now invest in illiquid assets. Investing abroad is okay. A bit of diversification might actually do you good. These are big changes. But he's still a troglodyte. You know, there is still uh, a huge distance to go to really start thinking about how you uh, 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 have a model of building blocks which in some way represent the overall investable universe. So what is the investable universe? Well, Andrew Smithers has written a book on saying basically there are two methods, lots of variants, but two methods only of valuing a financial asset. One is some form of replacement uh, value, so Tobin skew or something like that. And other, another one is some cyclically uh, adjusted measure of income. Think of the west of Ireland, full of empty holiday homes, billions and billions spent, income zero. What do we care about most? Income, probably. <laughs> That's the investment. It's income that we care about. Future income. Best measure of future income is past income. Best measure of past income is GDP. So that means 56% in emerging markets, does it not? Um, but, of course, if you're invested, if you look at the indices, they only measure what we call investable. We, actually, that, that doesn't mean, we don't mean investable. We mean easy to invest in, which is a different thing. You can invest pre-IPO. Remember, an IPO is an Indian entrepreneur's exit once they've made their 20 times, and they leave three, uh, another three times on the table. We have trillions of dollars as, as, a, as, a, as an industry. And it's not beyond our wherewithal, collectively, to work out how we actually get better access without paying, you know, two and twenty to every hedge fund or, or private equity firm and, and, you know, actually do it in a way that's, that's much, much better. We could do that. And I think we will do that. We'll get there eventually. Uh, waiting for every, uh, you know, company in India to, to do an IPO is, you know, definitely suboptimal. And that's the only way we're going to really get to a sort of GDP allocation. But the asset, the asset, the other problem is that we have some of the debates between asset allocation manager selection, I think are driven from some of the, the problems in theory. Um, we have uh, 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 you know, problems with passive and active and things like that. Passive investing, I mean, all I have to do there is, is really remind you of what happened in 01 in Argentina. So Argentina, serial defaulter. Um, nobody who didn't foresee months in advance that there was a major, major risk of default in Argentina in 01, has no right to be managing other people's money in emerging markets. Simple as that. It was so obvious. And the only people really who didn't, uh, <laughs> you know, who lost money were the, were the index trackers. The idea that somehow an asset class or an index is safe and you can't get safer than that, you can't reduce volatility further than that, is, is, is actually wrong. You were taught at business school that, you know, as you add 
uh, uh, assets to a portfolio randomly, then after about 15 assets, you can't get any more diversification. That's what's taught in business school. It's not wrong, but the key word is random. If you don't add them randomly, and you've got some intelligence, and you add, say, the low volatility or the low risks ones, then of course you can. No problem. Very easy exercise. Sometimes in our business, as, as William Booter famously said of the efficient market hypothesis, he said, this is perfectly obvious to anybody without a postgraduate degree from an Anglo-Saxon university in finance or economics. There's a bit of that, you know, there's a bit of, you know, of course, of course you can add a, 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 have a lower risk or lower volatility, volatility if you're intelligent about the stock selection. <coughs> there's nothing intrinsic about an asset class or an index which represents it, which makes it a building block. It's pure behaviour. There is also, we know a lot from behavioural finance, we know that um, people sometimes have a sort of layering, they have this pyramid, so we'll have some of our assets for you know, uh, preservation of capital, some for income and all. That's, that's like putting different jars on your mantelpiece and say this is for bread, this is for the laundry, this is for, you know, yeah, it might be useful, prop, it may be very important, it may there be very good reasons, but it is not optimal. It is not an optimal way to do asset allocation. So. We need to, I think, kind of radically change kind of the building blocks. We need to radically change some of the ways we think about asset allocation. I've tried to do that. The other, as I said, the other thing that, um, I said there were two things that were sort of innovative about my book, I, I hope. One was on, on uh, the, the structure of the investor base. The other was strategic thinking. If you are, uh, you know, if, if, if Svensson says, we know from behavioral finance that people get emotional, they have biases, so we'll only do our, you know, big asset, class, asset distribution decisions once a year. This is completely normal sometimes, it's five years or whatever. The problem here with that is that things change. You know, uh, you have to have, I think, the ability to, to, to react to real events. You know, if Lehman's just blown up, you kind of have to react that day. You, you can't just wait. So we need a mechanism to actually in, make sure we're alert, awake all the time, and we are actually uh, uh, able to change even the big decisions as events change. You know, passive investing is easy because you don't have to think. You know, it's a bit like saying, to say it's, it's superior is a bit like saying, well, if I'm driving a car, it saves energy if I close my eyes. It's true, it does. But it doesn't recommend itself, does it? I mean, it's not really very bright, you know. And um, so we have to, I think, work out, you know, when our assumptions, the standard assumptions, work and when they don't. A lot of, I start off a lot in the book, there's a lot of sort of uh, uh, different chapters, different, different subjects. As you get to the end of the book, there are more lists. <laughs> think of this, think of this, think of this. Keynes' book was 80% hatchet job on Marshall, the, you know, the, the, the neoclassical economics of the time, and then 20% beautiful theory, which I've uh, botched up and told you in one sentence. <laughs> um, Mine's a hatchet job. I don't have a beautiful theory. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not Keynes. It's a hatchet job. And what I'm saying is there is no beautiful theory that I can think of. There's, you just have to think. Thinking is hard work. Thinking is difficult. We don't like thinking. That's why we have models. That's why we have prejudices. Oh, prejudices. They're models that somebody else thinks are wrong, right? <laughs> um, they're also bits of, bits of they're things we don't think about. And prejudices are also important because we use them as part of our self and group identity. It's important for people to uh, maintain continuity in their views. Gives them psychological balance or sort of things. So a whole bunch of you, when you walk out of the room, will think, oh, that's a load of rubbish. Or you'll think, oh, yeah, that was really interesting, but I can, but, but, there's some, some way you can discount it. So in 02, the but for a lot of people was Brazil. You know? So we had a whole series of reasons. It's very interesting. I want someone to do a PhD on this subject. In 2002, every couple of weeks, there was another reason coming out of Wall Street why you should sell Brazil. And it was just different every two weeks, because but it would be proved wrong, and then it'd come out with another one. Today, it's China. People need a reason not to invest in emerging markets. It's easy to say, I don't do it. It sounds risky. It's foreign. It's lots of... But rational reasons, you know, you can come up with reasons, and then we knock them down, and you just have another one, another one. So this is why, at the moment, China is the bugbear. You know, they've got all these off-balance uh, uh, debts, and that's going to cause a huge problem. Well, why are bad debts bad? Well, I'll tell you why they're bad. Because they can cause sudden credit stops, and that creates crisis. But that's not going to happen in China. If I take the word bank, rub it out, and put social expenditure department, money goes out of the bank, it doesn't come back. 
That's China, right? And then what happens is every few years, the central government bails them out. So this then becomes a national accounts problem. Can, this is fiscal expenditure. <laughs> Can they afford it? Uh, yes. <laughs> so, you know, that's a, different, that's a different analysis. You know, they have... Um, I won't go, I won't spend too, well, maybe there'll be questions on China. I think the, the, uh, 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 the other thing I want to say about uh, 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 the structure of the investor base, um, this is very important, I think, for really starting to work out how we can, A, manage risk, and B, how we can uh, uh, regulate, actually, as well, for policymakers. Um, so in Brazil, the, uh, the central bank actually ensures that every instrument is registered. And what that means is that uh, when there's a crisis, they know exactly where all the pools of liquidity are, and they know where to intervene and how much. It's very interesting. Couldn't do that in the United States. Not a hope. Um, it's because you know where the money is and how much that's the key to understanding uh, systemic risk and how to regulate. Not what. So, you know, say I'm a corporate client on one hand, and I've got my mean investment bank on the other side, <laughs> right? Investment bank sells to the corporate client a hedge because they've, they've got this thing, whatever it is, an asset, a, a foreign exchange risk, and they want to hedge against it. So they buy this lovely hedge from this nice investment bank person. And then, of course, the investment bank lays off the risk. If there's not a liquid market, they sell it, price goes down, funnily enough. <laughs> then the hedge is activated, you come to the investment bank, uh, and of course, uh, the hedge looks like it's worked, wonderful, and so we're all, you know, what's changed? Well, I'll tell you what's changed. The investment bank has got some fees. That's about it, really. Oh, and the investor thinks that they've been, you know, well served by the investment bank, right? If you start, and likewise from the, from the from the regulator's point of view, if you start focusing on instruments, you're going to miss most of the story. It's not what instrument. You shouldn't be regulating derivatives or this. You should be measuring everything. And who has it? And I'm in favour of not only having maps of who owns what, but then maps also of their belief systems. Coming back right back to what I started with, you know, what they think, what their worldviews are. And part of that's their liability structure, of course. You can do a lot by just what types of investors they are. So that's what I'm sort of uh, trying to say there. But the, um, the, uh, 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 the other thing that I, I, I want to just mention is um, what I call core periphery disease. I talked about prejudice uh, a little bit ago. And for me, core, I call it disease because <laughs> it's, it's more than just a theory or uh, it's a deep-seated meme. A meme is a sort of intellectual <coughs> virus. And the core periphery meme, this disease, has been with us several hundred years. This is the idea that what happens in the core, Western Europe, United States, Japan to a certain extent, affects the periphery, the emerging markets. Uh, but we, completely, we can completely ignore the effects of the periphery on the core. That's core periphery disease. So, you know, maybe that didn't really matter uh, in, in some periods in, in the past. It matters now. Why? Okay, so we have, it's very fashionable to say that if... US interest rates rise. Oh, didn't the guy from Bridgewater just say in the paper that if US interest rise, you might get a 1937 style depression? And did the Fed yesterday just say, well, maybe we won't interest rate, raise interest rates quite so fast? <laughs> of course, they don't want to raise interest rates because they, they know perfectly well what's going on. The optimal central bank policy is to keep your guests, actually, distract you. It's more than that. They want to distract you because then they're robbing you, by the way. If you've got very high levels of debt, um, you basically either and if they're in your own currency, there are two tried and tested ways of reducing the real value of that debt. One is through outright inflation, 70s. The other, very successful after the war in both uh, Europe and the United States, is called financial repression. Uh, basically, where you capture domestic savings, which means telling them that they have to obey solvency too, for example, uh, and you tell them they have to invest in liquid assets or they have to invest in highly rated assets. Oh, by the way, they're the government assets that we're going <laughs> to issue to you. Um, oh, and they've got a negative yield, but you don't mind that, do you? Um, and then under no circumstances, the, you know, if you're a buy and hold investor, can you probably get your money back in real terms. But you don't mind because it's low risk, if that's what we define as risk. Um, so we have this ability to financial repression is any policy that captures domestic savings to fund the government and to do so at a lower cost than would otherwise be possible. So I talked about QE being a mechanism to uh, rescue the banks. It's now got a second function. Its second function is to help uh, that financial repression by keeping 
interest rates at zero, what you then do is you have inflation at sort of 3%. And then over a period of a decade, you erode the value of the debt. That's what financial repression does. So, but why, maybe people will notice and they'll demand more money. So what you do is you have a, just like a ma magician, you have a distraction. So say you're Mark Carney, he's very good at this actually, he's particularly good I think. Every six or eight weeks, he says something which changes the market sentiment about inflation and growth. That's what the Fed did yesterday. They change it. So, you know, is there, a, is there a, you know, nearly full employment in the United States or is it relevant that the underemployment is still 15 to 17 percent? And although there's been a big improvement, there are still 46 million people on food stamps in the United States, down from a massively higher 47 million. You know, that doesn't look very healthy, but what we do is, you know, we, every few weeks we change, the central banks change the, the perception, market perception a bit. And, the, you know, QE has been an important part of, of that, that whole process. So, I was talking about, I was trying to talk about, I, got, I, I digress. I was going to talk a bit about um, core periphery. So, core periphery disease, uh, an example, is getting worried that the Fed uh, 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 rate increase is somehow, somehow going to cause... Uh, uh, this massive outpouring you know, from emerging markets. Because, of course, we have this linear view of risk. You know, if, if something is risk-free, by the way, that's an abuse of the English language. There's no such thing as a risk-free asset. Um, but if we, we have this linear approach, so if, if, if the US is risky, the emerging markets must, by definition, be riskier. Right? And, and uh, if the US Fed changes interest rates, of course that's going to affect every central bank in the world. I mean, forget about the evidence that this is not true. Don't worry about that. Uh, because actually, in, on a day, you know, the next day, that probably is true. But for more than a few days, it isn't. It really isn't. So we have, but, but we, we assume that the US, Europe, has a huge impact on everybody. But we ignore the impact the other way around. So uh, the, there were reports. I remember one IMF report shortly after 2008. And it asked the question, and we, you're still getting the same reports, different numbers, but they asked the question, how much money might leave the emerging markets if there was another problem in Europe or the United States? And the, the answer came back, $15 billion. Okay, core periphery disease is not asking the question the other way around. It's saying, it's not asking the question, how much money might leave Europe and the United States if there's another problem in Europe and the United States? In other words, how much emerging market capital might be withdrawn? Remembering that they already have uh, $12 trillion of just so-called liquid US and European sovereign bonds in their portfolio, and another four or five in sovereign wealth funds, right? We're talking two orders of magnitude, more money might go the other way. Oh, but that'll never happen. But it did happen in 1971. I just told you that story. It did happen. So we have to start realising the importance of these big macroeconomic problems that I talked about earlier are essential for understanding everything. You can't understand the US equity market unless you understand these issues. I pity the poor you know, uh, uh, wire journalist at the end of the New York day. He has to ring around to try and work out what happened when the stocks and the bonds go up the same day. Because it's not meant to happen. And he finds, you know, ten different people to talk to and maybe two of them say the same thing. So he writes it down and then everybody reads it. No, oh, that's what happened. You know, now we know. <laughs> you know there's, a very, there's a huge amount of confusion in the market because people are not thinking about the fundamentals, they're not thinking about the bigger picture. Good. Thank you very Thanks much. Thank you very much.